we, we just have a couple of other items in section 6.2 that we need to talk about. One of those is the mean and the standard deviation of binomial probability distributions. And then the other is graphs of binomial probability distributions. So in chapter five, we had a formula for finding the mean and the standard deviation of a discrete probability distribution. And we could use that formula for binomial probability distributions. But it turns out there's a shortcut for figuring out the mean and the standard deviation, specifically when we have a binomial probability distribution. So a binomial experiment with n independent trials and the probability of success p has a mean and standard deviation given by the formulas. So if it's a binomial distribution, the mean will simply equal n times p, the number of trials times the probability of success. The standard deviation will equal the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. So that's the number of trials times the probability of success times the probability of failure. 1 minus p is the probability of failure. And if we square root that, that gives us the standard deviation. So example, for the allergy sufferers example from before, how many of the 20 users would you expect to experience insomnia as a side effect? What would be the standard deviation? So the number that we would expect is the mean. So we want to find the mean and we want to find the standard deviation. Now, for that problem, remember n equal 20 and p equal 0.05. So the mean is simply 20 times 0.05. And if you take 20 times 0.05, that is one. So we would have expected one patient of the 20 to experience insomnia as a side effect. If you think about it, 5% of people suffer insomnia as a side effect of taking Clarinex D. So if I give Clarinex D to 20 people, I would expect 5% of those 20 people to suffer insomnia. So 5% of 20 is 20 times 0.05. That's just one. If I gave Clarinex D to 100 people, I would expect five of them to suffer insomnia. 5% of 100 would be five, and so on. Now the standard deviation is the square root of n, so that's 20, times p, 0.05, times 1 minus p, which would be 0.95. And that 0.95 right there is 1 minus 0.05. That's the probability of failure. So if I take the square root of 20 times 0.05 times 0.95, that is 0.97 five if I round to three places. So I would expect one person to experience insomnia as a side effect and the standard deviation is 0.975. So that's given me an idea of the dispersion of that. So again, just a shortcut if we have a binomial of how we can find the mean and the standard deviation, and we don't have to go through that nastier formula that we looked at back in chapter five. The last thing that we have in this section is to talk about the graphs of binomial distributions. And so to talk about this, I am gonna go back into StatCrunch and use the binomial calculator there. So I still have the binomial calculator up here. And the example on the notes says, using technology, graph each binomial distribution described with n equals 10 and various values of p ranging from 0.10 to 0.90. So I'm going to change n to 10. And again, it wants us to look at the graph varying p from 0.10 to 0.90. So right here is that graph. So the probability of zero successes is represented by this black bar, one success by this red bar, two successes, three successes, four successes, five successes. Notice that it's six successes. The probability of success is so small at that point that you can't even really see the bar. 
And then seven, eight, nine, ten, they didn't even include on the graph because it's so small. Here's the point. If you had to describe the shape of that distribution right there, is that bell-shaped, skewed left, skewed right, uniform, bimodal? What do we have there? Skewed right. So I'm going to leave this at 10, and I'm going to increase my probability of success to be 0.20 instead of 0.10, and regraph. Now this is the graph if n is 10 and p is 0.20. Describe the shape. Is that uniform, bell-shaped, skewed left, skewed right, bimodal? What do we have? Still skewed right. Now, if you were to compare this graph to the previous graph, both of them were skewed right, but if I go back to the previous one, that's more skewed right. So when it's 0.10, it was really skewed right. 0.20 is still skewed right, but not as much. And what if I change it to 0.30? Still skewed right, but even less. And 0.40? Still skewed right a little bit, but not a lot. 0.50? What's that shape? Would you agree that's bell-shaped? So when P was less than 0.5, our distribution was skewed right. How much it was skewed right depended on how far it was from 0.5. The farther away P is from 0.5, the more skewed right it is. The closer it is to 0.5, the more bell-shaped it is. Again, I'll go back to 0.40. That's still skewed right a little bit, but that also looks pretty bell-shaped. Now, what happens when I go past, like to 0.6? When P's 0.6, now I'm skewed left a little bit. And if I go to 0.7, now I'm skewed left even more. 0.8, skewed left even more. 0.9, skewed left even more. So the closer P is to 0.5, the more bell-shaped this binomial distribution is going to be. The farther away I am from 0.5, the more skewed it's going to be. If P is less than 0.5, it's going to be skewed right. If P is greater than 0.5, it's going to be skewed left. So that was the point of the example that I have on the bottom of the page with the mean formula. And if you flip to the next page, next it says, uh, now fix the value of P at 0.20 and vary the value of N from 10 to 1,000. So I'm still going to be using StatCrunch here. And I'm going to fix p to be 0.20. So that's not going to change. And I'm going to start with n equals 10. So n equals 10 and p is 0.20. We have a skewed right distribution. But what if I increase the size of 10? And what if I make it like 20? Still skewed right. What if I increase it to like 50? Still skewed right a little bit, but it is more bell-shaped. And what if I increase to 100? Even more bell-shaped. And 1,000. That is like almost perfect. 10,000. So as the number of trials is going up, even though I'm leaving P to be 0.2, as the number of trials goes up, the shape of this distribution becomes more and more perfect bell shape. Now, why does that happen? I can't tell you why. It just does. And it's amazing. It's amazing that it's this perfect. In fact, what that actually is, that shape is the shape of what is called a normal curve. And we're going to talk about normal curves in Chapter 7. So back to the notes page. So now fix the values of P at 0.20 and vary the values of N from 10 to 1,000. What happens to the shape of the binomial distribution as N increases? As N increases, the shape becomes more perfectly bell-shaped. 
So when is the binomial distribution bell-shaped enough to just say it's bell-shaped? Well, that's this rule right here. For a fixed P, that's the probability of success, as the number of trials in in a binomial experiment increases, the probability distribution of the random variable X becomes bell-shaped. As a rule of thumb, so this is gonna be like our standard, as a rule of thumb, if N times P times one minus P is greater than or equal to 10, the probability distribution will be approximately bell-shaped. So this right here is gonna be our standard. If n times p times 1 minus p, if that calculation is 10 or bigger, then we're going to say the binomial distribution is bell-shaped. Note, the above results allow us to use the empirical rule to identify unusual observations in a binomial experiment. Recall, if a distribution is bell-shaped, then 95% of the observations will lie within two standard deviations of the mean. Do you remember the empirical rule? 68% of the data is within one standard deviation, 95% is within two standard deviations, 99.7% is within three standard deviations, if we have a bell-shaped distribution. So if a binomial distribution meets this condition, it's bell-shaped. And if it's bell-shaped, then that means that 95% of the data will be within two standard deviations of the mean. So anything that's more than two standard deviations from the mean would be unusual. So this is going to be a standard we can use to try to determine if something's unusual or not. Morality. In a recent poll, the Gallup organization found that 45% of adult Americans believe that the overall state of moral values in the United States is poor. Compute the mean and standard deviation of the random variable X, the number of adults who believe that the overall state of moral values in the United States is poor based on a random sample of 500 adults. So in other words, if we take a random sample of 500 adults, how many would we expect to say that the state of morals in the United States is poor, and what would the standard deviation be? So we know from the setup of this problem that N equals 500 and P equals 0.45. So the mean is just going to equal 500 times 0.45. And so that is 225. So we would expect 225 people out of the 500 to say that the state of morals is poor. The standard deviation will be the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. So that would be the square root of 500 times 0.45 times 1 minus 0.45, which would be 0.55. The square root of 500 times 0.45 times 0.55. And so that is 11.124 approximately. So the mean are the expected values 225 with a standard deviation of 11.124. B, interpret the mean. So this is the answer to A. So B, it's the expected value, right? In a poll of 500, Adult Americans, we would expect two hundred twenty five to state that morals are poor. 
Now, to be honest, part C is really why I'm doing this example. So C is the real purpose of me having this in the notes. Would it be unusual to identify 240 adult Americans who believe that the overall state of morals in the United States is poor based on a random sample of 500 adult Americans and why? So if we took a sample and got a result of 240 who said the state of morals is poor, would that be an unusual result? That's the question. Well, for C, I'm going to check n times p times 1 minus p and see if that's greater than 10. So in this particular case, that would be 500 times 0.45 times 0.55. It's the standard deviation without the square root. So that's 123.75. That's way bigger than 10. So because this is bigger than 10, this distribution is normal, is bell-shaped, I should say. And so since it's bell-shaped, that means the empirical rule applies. So therefore, the empirical rule applies. So if I take the mean and subtract two standard deviations, and if I take the mean plus two standard deviations, this would be like the range of what should usually happen. Anything outside of that range would be unusual. So if I take the mean, 225, and if I subtract two times 11.124, and if I take 225 plus two times 11.124, that's going to give me the usual range. So that's 202.752. And if I add, that is 247.248. So again, this right here is the usual range. So our question was, would it be unusual to identify 240 adult Americans who believe the state of morals is poor? So would it be unusual to get a result of 240? The answer to that question is no because 240 is inside this range. So 240 would be usual. So a result of 240 is not unusual. Now, if it would have said, would it be unusual to identify 250 adult Americans who believe the overall state of morals is four? Had this said 250 instead of 240, 250 would be unusual because 250 is outside this range. And in fact, 200 would be unusual because it would be outside of the range. Anything less than 202.752 would be unusual Anything greater than 247.248 would be unusual, but anything in between is not unusual. Now, again, you can only do that if you know that you have a bell-shaped distribution. So you have to check this condition to make sure that you have a bell-shaped distribution to be able to use the empirical rule.